All right, good morning, everyone. It is 11 o'clock, and I'd like to welcome all of you to this morning's webinar on guidance in implementing regulations surrounding communicable diseases and analysis of local government health, or I'm sorry, local health department and local health officer powers, duties, and enforcement actions. My name is Sarah Diedrich Kasdorf. I'm the Deputy Director of Government Affairs at the Wisconsin Counties Association. And I had the pleasure of cheering the work group that developed the final product before you today. The guidance document that we released last Friday is a compilation of many weeks of work by an ad hoc committee tasked with creating a body of knowledge that provides guidance to local governments on how to provide a meaningful regulatory system to combat the spread of a communicable disease at the local level. Although the work at this committee was triggered by our current public health pandemic, this guidance is intended to address other situations and issues related to the regulation of communicable diseases, whether local, regional, or global in nature. The work of our committee was guided by four principles. How do we best protect the public's health? How can a local government regulatory process be practically implemented? How will a local government provide an enforcement mechanism? And how can we create public awareness, understanding, and support for health and safety in the context of the regulatory process? This guidance is intended to provide, just as its name suggests, guidance. And you will hear us use that term quite a bit when referencing this document. The document itself is not a template and it is not a model ordinance. The guidance is also not intended as legal advice. Instead, we do uh, ask counties to work with their corporation council in creating their own ordinances and policies related to communicable disease regulation. Although the guidance document has been released, please know that the Wisconsin Counties Association does remain committed to assisting counties as we navigate this public health crisis together. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I just would like to give a quick shout out to the members of the work group uh, for all of their time uh, that they dedicated to, to several meetings, as well as reviewing multiple drafts of the guidance document. Uh, the work group uh, did uh, consist of members from a number of organizations, including the Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards, the League of Wisconsin Municipalities, the Wisconsin Association of County Corporation Council, the Wisconsin Restaurant Association, the Fox Cities Chamber of Commerce, and I do want to give a shout out to WCA's two official reps on the committee, Steve O'Malley, who is the La Crosse County Administrator, and Paul Sisenka, who is the Bayfield County Sheriff. So before turning this over to our, um, to our presenters for today, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping with regard to the Q&A portion of the presentation. If you wish to ask a question during the webinar, please use the Q&A feature that you can find on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Just click on the, the little Q&A uh, icon there, type in your question, and our speakers will be monitoring the Q&A uh, or the Q&A function uh, throughout the webinar. And as they did on Monday, they will attempt to answer questions as we move throughout the document. If you are on the phone and are unable to access the Q&A document, please hit star nine, we will unmute you and then call on you to ask your question. All right, now to today's uh, two speakers. Our first speaker today that I'm going to introduce is Eric Osterman. Eric is the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards. Eric spent a considerable amount of time coordinating the public health response to this guidance document and providing perspective on behalf of our local health officers. Um, but really leading this effort and the author of this document is a person who I think everybody in the county family is very familiar with, Andy Phillips from Von Briesen and Roper. Andy really did an outstanding job drafting, coordinating responses, uh, revising the document, talking to additional people, uh, continuing to revise the document, where we think we got to a point where everybody was, was very comfortable with it as, as part of the committee and also others external to our, our, our small uh, group. Um, Andy and I have really been joking that since this document has been released, he'll have so much free time that he will not know what to do with himself. Um, but really, um, I do wanna thank Andy for all the tremendous work that he did on this guidance document. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy to get us started. 
Thank you, sir. Very kind words. I don't know how much you meant of all of those words, but they were very kind. I appreciate that. And Eric, thanks for your help too. We're going to walk through this document in a way that um, it's very difficult to try to take a document like this and summarize it. And so we thought it best to have these webinars as an opportunity to verbally communicate. Here it is how the document is laid out, why it's laid out the way it is, and otherwise answer questions that anybody on the webinar might have regarding this. Sarah, I know that we're re we recorded the webinar on Monday. Are we recording this one as well? Yes, we're recording this one as well. And so you can find a copy of the webinar once it's done on the WCA's website. And that way, if you want to share the webinar's contents with others to the extent you find it helpful or useful, please absolutely feel free to do so. And so I wanna start with talking about this guidance and going through the various sections and what they do. We of course have the introduction here and the, the issue, if you will, that set the tone for why this guidance came to fruition is really what happened in the spring of this year when we had a series of executive and emergency orders issued. And then we had a litigation reaction. As a lawyer myself, um, I suppose I should be happy that we had a legal involvement in the entire pandemic response, but as a member of society and a citizen and a taxpayer, it unfortunately created a lot of consternation, concern, and confusion out there in the general public. And so on May 15th, we had the Supreme Court in Wisconsin issue a decision in the case of Legislature v. Palm that in very simple terms said, Secretary Palm did not have the statutory authority to issue Emergency Order 28, that was Safer at Home Order and the follow-on orders, and essentially said to local governments, you're in charge of any sort of Safer at Home response. Um, counties, local health departments had never before been in a position to actually have some sort of response to what is truly a global pandemic. And so there were a lot of questions and a lot of confusion and a lot of issues surrounding what is it that local health departments and counties have in terms of enforcement authority to the extent that a local unit of government, a county, a city, a village, a health department wants to enact some sort of local type regulation, do we even have that type of authority? And so the ad hoc committee that was formed by the counties association tremendous foresight by mark o'connell sarah diedrich and others at wca to say we're going to have a discussion about providing some foundational knowledge and foundational concepts to local governments out there so that you know everybody's going to act and react a little bit differently as it relates to these various issues but at least as it relates to the legal underpinnings and the foundational knowledge let's give everybody that body of knowledge and so this guidance isn't intended to advocate for one position or another. It's not suggesting that counties must take action. It's not suggesting that counties shouldn't take action. The guidance is merely is intended as providing that foundational base of knowledge so that when counties or cities or villages or health departments do take action, this hopefully is a reference guide for them in defining what action they should take according to their local circumstances and what type of issues might they confront as they contemplate that particular action. The other thing that's important to note is that while this document and frankly a lot of the work that we've been doing has been driven by the COVID-19 pandemic and the response to that pandemic, really we're dealing with communicable disease in general. And so we want this guidance or our intent was to provide this guidance as a mechanism to provide the foundational knowledge for all communicable disease, not just COVID-19. And frankly, if you look historically at what health officers at the local level have done over the years, largely they're responding to a whole bunch of different communicable diseases. And they've done so without any sort of controversy or complaint for many, many years. And so we thought again, that it would be important to highlight some of those activities at the local level that have been going on for many, many years without controversy or comment. So while we do understand this guidance will impact uh, local government and its reaction to COVID-19, it's not intended to just be a COVID-19 document, it's a communicable disease document. And so Sarah mentioned the four guideposts, if you will, that we operated under as our ad hoc. And so we have those four guideposts that are again there in the guidance 
We also have the proviso that you see throughout the guidance that these are some tricky issues. And it was never my intent or the intent of any other lawyers that served on this ad hoc committee to provide legal advice to counties or local governments. That's reserved to your own counsel, your own lawyer. And so given the complexities associated with these issues, very, very advisable that counties and local governments work with their own lawyers in adopting or crafting whatever regulations they deem necessary as a result of this particular pandemic. The summary of guidance is important because it kind of sets the stage. And so what we wanted here, and, and you know, I'll admit, this is a legal summary, all right? It doesn't get into all of the history of communicable disease regulation, it doesn't get into the ordinance template that we have at the back of the guidance and things like this. This summary is a legal summary talking about the categories that we're dealing with here in the context of this guidance. And what do I mean by categories? Well, when we look at the whole issue of regulating and suppressing and preventing the spread of a communicable disease and regulating the public in the context of that desire to prevent or suppress the spread of a communicable disease, really we're breaking it down into what we term three different categories. And the three categories are number one, isolation or quarantine orders that apply to a specific person. And as you'll see throughout the guidance, there is specific statutory and administrative code guidance there as it relates to isolation and quarantine. The second category are what we termed outbreak orders. You're not going to find the term outbreak order anywhere in the statutes or the administrative code. It's a descriptor. It's a descriptor because, again, we're dealing with specific orders dealing with a specific circumstance in a specific person or group of people. And so those outbreak orders that are, again, dealing with specific persons or specific people, they are, again, defined in statute and administrative code. And then we get into the, what we've called the small subset of the subset of what it is that a local health officer does, and that is issue these orders that are applicable to the general public. Meaning, when we talk about the context of Safer at Home, an order that requires social distancing, in order that requires there be reduced capacity in certain commercial establishments, things that are applicable, again, to the general public. And then the questions surrounding how do you make those sorts of orders enforceable? Because, again, it's not, there's no clear blueprint in statute. And to the extent that the blueprint was clear, the legislature v. Palm decision made that blueprint not as clear. And so the guidance, again, deals with that subset of issues. And then as we talk about those subsets of issues, there are different enforcement mechanisms associated with each of those subsets. And so the guidance goes through in sometimes painstaking detail discussing the particular enforcement provisions as it relates to each of those subsets of orders. And so if you take away the summary from this document as a standalone and say, here's a summary of what the guidance is, in some ways, I will admit that it is not an accurate summary of the entire body of the guidance. But what the summary does is provide the reader with insight as to what the committee was looking at in terms of trying to break down the analysis as it relates to the role of a local health officer in dealing with the prevention of the spread of a communicable disease and also the enforcement mechanism so that when a health officer takes particular action with backing that particular action to make it quote unquote enforceable. The guidance then proceeds to discuss various terminology and definitions. This isn't terminology and definitions used within the guidance, although some of these phrases are, but this is terminology and definitions so that when public health officers speak, we know what they're speaking to. In other words, I think public health officers refer to these various terms daily. And they use those terms daily, and it's their speak. It's their language. It's no different than a lawyer speaking legal ease. So the guidance takes some of that terminology and puts it in terms that are understandable to the public. So when a health officer is using a term like an epidemic or cluster or pandemic or conducting a risk, risk assessment, isolation, quarantine, we know what it is that the health officer is speaking to. And I think that's important because we have to understand that health officers are performing some various, some very, very complex functions and they are practicing a craft. They are not doing rote work. They are actually use, utilizing professional discretion and making their determinations. 
And so there is a gap between that professional expertise at the health officer level and then the expertise at the governing body level, whether it be a county board, city council, or village board. Um, those entities, uh, their responsibility is to legislate. Their responsibilities go back to the electorate that put them in their seats. And so we wanted to try to bridge that gap a little bit with this guidance and try to unveil some of the terminology that's used at the health officer level as well. Then as we continue through the guidance, we thought it important to have a history of communicable disease regulation. Why is this history important? Because I think there's been a lot of comment out there, legally and otherwise, about the propriety of government imposing restrictions on the civil liberties of the populace in a time of a pandemic. And a lot of that commentary ignores the fact that we've had several cases out there historically that have addressed this issue. And so the reason that we put this history piece in here is to provide context for what's happening today. Every single case that I've read dealing with the pandemic and government's reaction to the pandemic and government's attempts to impose restrictions on, or at least alleged restrictions on alleged civil liberties, I wanna be very careful here, is that a lot of these cases deal with allegations and they haven't been litigated yet, so we don't know exactly the boundaries of, of some of these issues. But every single one of those cases cites to the Jacobson v. Massachusetts case, and you can see that that was a case decided in 1905, 115 years ago. And that was the United States Supreme Court that issued that decision. The Jacobson case dealt with mandatory smallpox vaccinations. Mr. Jacobson emigrated um, to the United States and he was not in favor of receiving a vaccination. He refused. He said, look, you don't have a right to demand my vaccination because my beliefs, religious or otherwise, prevent me from receiving a vaccination. I don't want it. You can't make me get it. The Supreme Court disagreed. The United States Supreme Court in a 72 decision, so it was not unanimous, but it was pretty overwhelming in terms of the majority. The Supreme Court said that as a society, our government has a right to curtail certain civil liberties in times of emergency and in order to prevent the spread of communicable disease. That case provides the foundation for a recognition that, yeah, there are circumstances where government has the ability to intervene. I'm not suggesting that government has to intervene in all circumstances. I'm saying government has the ability to intervene in certain circumstances, those emergency cases, and either mandate certain conduct on the part of the public. In the Jacobson case, it was vaccination, or prohibit certain conduct on the part of the public. That would be an, an example of that would be, for example, in emergency order 28, the prescription on certain activities involving mass gatherings. So again, the Jacobson course provides the legal foundation for all of the regulation that we see coming out today. And then the history does go through from a Wisconsin perspective, how Wisconsin has dealt with the whole issue of communicable disease. Um, the question about how Wisconsin has dealt with the questions surrounding communicable disease regulation is another section within this guidance. And the statutes that we have on the books, primarily chapter 252, that's the chapter dealing with regulation of communicable disease, both at the state and the local level. They've been around since 1981 in their current form. There've been some updates, there've been some rememberings, but for the most part, if you look at 252.03, which is the statute dealing with duties of local health officers, that statute has been around in its current form since 1981. So. Again, we're talking about 40 years of existence on the books, whereas now all of a sudden we have that spotlight on chapter 252, and in particular 252.03, that spotlight has never existed on that statutory section before. So before I get into the overview of legal authority, because when we talk about the meat of the guidance, we have two sections, the overview and then the enforcement section. Before I get into discussion on those two sections, I'll ask Eric if there's anything that he wanted to add as it relates to, again, the introductory parts of this guidance that lay the, lay the framework or lay, uh, set the stage for the discussion. Yep, thank you, Andy. Um, I, I would just start by sharing uh, a thank you and appreciation uh, on behalf of the Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards to participate in this process. Uh, and a special thank you to WCA staff, both Sarah and Andy, for their support and leadership on the project. Um, I would share um, that the work group um, 
the, the work group really had a, a great deal of open and honest discussion on what are key policy issues that were raised uh, by the pandemic. And it was very um, informative uh, from a public health perspective to hear those different um, considerations and uh, different perspectives on those, on those policy issues. I think the cumulative discussions that we had um, provided a lot of things for us to consider and how to uh, further improve uh, what the public health department response look like, looks like in order for us to be successful in managing what is really the, the primary responsibility to control and suppress communicable disease in communities. Um, you know, our, our work isn't started by thinking about how do we enforce, how do we find, our work is really how do we make sure that we keep our communities healthy and prior to the pandemic, I don't think a lot of people know the work that goes into making sure that our communities are healthy because for the most part, that, that work is successful. There's an occasional, occasionally uh, an outbreak of norovirus or pertussis or tuberculosis, or you know, we might learn about uh, different actions that our health departments are taking. But for the most part, health departments are managing over 130 reportable communicable diseases without much public attention to it. So. The pandemic certainly raised a lot of issues that we hadn't anticipated before. I'd also share kind of in just a last set of comments before Andy, you continue um, that, you know, as I said, we public health has been managing communicable disease forever and the, the Palm case in May really had an unexpected impact for health departments and um, you know, what we talked about in the work group and the resulting guidance, you know, we're still, you know, learning with you in order to determine how best to adapt that locally. Um, the biggest, the biggest impact from a public health perspective to the Palm case was um, in any kind of emergency preparedness, I don't think there was an anticipation that there would not be a state response to a global pandemic. And so, one of the results of the Palm case pushing the action and the activity and the public health response to a local level it was truly unexpected and unanticipated, but that's the situation we're in. And I think the work group you know, did a good job of discussing a variety of issues related to that. Um, since then, there has been additional legal or judicial activity that continues to give us reason to uh, review uh, what our plans are, uh, and again, uh, further validates the the work. Um, you know the 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 need to convene a, a work group such as such as we did. Um, but that the the Palm case and subsequent legal and judicial activity has unfortunately caused some to start and stop development of orders, some completely pause development of orders, and so you know do do hope that with the publication of this guidance and the following conversations that will be held locally that we'll be able to pick that back up again um, and to make sure that we're prepared to deal with new and unexpected policy issues that that come up uh, moving forward uh, again we did a really good job over the last couple of months um, reacting to the the changing conditions and there will certainly be more to share more more to learn more to discuss as we continue to move through this pandemic and also other future unexpected emerging um, public health and communicable disease issues. So again, I appreciate WCA's leadership on this project, the opportunity to participate and Andy, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks Eric and, and we appreciated your support and guidance throughout this process as well. I wanna tell you that the various perspectives that were involved in that committee made it a very difficult job, here's why. As a lawyer, my job is to keep my clients out of jail. And so I always perform a risk analysis whenever a county is going to take a particular action. And I'll tell my client whether I think something is going to withstand judicial scrutiny or not. And so it's very challenging from my perspective to have a discussion about that type of risk analysis from a legal standpoint with somebody whose job it is to not consider the legal risk, but to consider the public health risk. And and so trying to meld those two concepts was not easy. We had a lot of discussions about, well, what's a legal decision? What's a policy decision? And how do we prepare this guidance in a way such that we are letting people know of issues, but not advocating for one particular route or another? That was, that was a bit like dancing on the head of a pin, but I think we accomplished that with the guidance and trying 
to again issue spot to allow counties and local health departments to make their own informed decision about what it is they're going to do and how they're going to react. So Eric, again, thank you for your work and getting everybody on the same page, at least as it relates to the foundation the issue spotting function. I think that's been very, very helpful. Um, as we get into this overview of local health officer authority, as you might recall, when I started this discussion about the guidance, I talked about the three categories. Those were three categories of orders, all right? When we talk about the overview of authority, we really divided it into four categories of powers. And it was important to recognize the first category that had nothing to do with issuing orders because it's that first category that provides the underpinning for the analysis of the other three categories. In other words, that first category, which is investigation and reporting, plays a role in isolation and quarantine orders, in the outbreak orders, and then the orders of general application. And so the guidance recognizes, and the committee thought it was very important to recognize the investigation and reporting function and powers that the health officer at the local level has. So as we look at 25203 sub 1, it starts with this whole concept of a health officer immediately investigating all of the circumstances when a communicable disease appears in his or her jurisdiction. Once that investigation is complete, the health officer has a duty, not a choice, but a duty to make a full report through the appropriate governing body, whether that be the, the Board of Health uh, at the local level, the county board, the um, city council or village board, and to the state. And it makes that report to the state through DHS, the Department of Health Services. Now again, the reason that this is important is that all of the authority that flows to a local health officer under 252.03, that's the operative statute, all of the to the local health officer have as their underpinning this requirement that the powers be exercised in a reasonable and necessary fashion. And so what is going to weigh on that determination of what's reasonable and what's necessary? Well, it's the investigation and it's the reports because the investigation and the report are going to identify the circumstances that are requiring the health officer to take whatever particular action is contemplated. And so again, it's the investigative and reporting function that plays a very important role here. And then the guidance gets into the specific orders that a health officer has the authority to issue. We first have isolation and quarantine orders. Again, this is very well defined in statute. If you look at 252.06 sub 1, it provides specific guidance as to when a health officer can take particular action with respect to an individual who is either has either been exposed to the disease or has contracted the disease. And so in that circumstance, the health officer has the power to issue those orders. I'll get into how those orders are enforced in a bit, but again, we're talking about the power to issue those quarantine or isolation orders. In addition to the statute 25206, we also have an administrative code provision that speaks to this. I'll talk about that later because it deals with more with the enforcement mechanism, but it's chapter DHS 145.06. So we've got statute and we've got administrative code that deals with the circumstance where an individual has either contracted the disease or has been exposed to the disease. And then we get into this concept of outbreak orders. As I mentioned before, outbreak order is not found in statute. That term's not found in the administrative code. It's a definite term that's used solely for purposes of this guidance. But what we're talking about there is a group of people, a gathering spot, a business, a commercial establishment where we've had a cluster of cases identified, an outbreak, if you will, of a particular communicable disease at that spot. And something has to be done about trying to prevent or suppress the spread of that disease as a result of that hot spot or that outbreak. And so when we deal with those orders, they're treated no differently than the isolation and quarantine orders in terms of enforcement under the administrative code. And again, I'll get to that in a moment, but again, we thought it important for purposes of this guidance to break out those particular situations because they're not isolation or quarantine orders per se. They're dealing with a different set of circumstances. Uh, the health officer is gonna look at the situation a bit differently. We've had a lot of discussion in the last few weeks about the desire by certain local officials and even state officials to identify commercial establishments where a particular outbreak has occurred um, and make that information public. We've had pushback from the business community about the identification 
of those particular commercial establishments. And so that's what we're talking about here is the identification of an outbreak and then what measures are going to be implemented to try to prevent the exacerbation of a bad situation because of that outbreak. So those are the outbreak orders that are discussed in the guidance. And then we have this category of general orders. And frankly, this is the most difficult ones to deal with, this category. The reason it's difficult is that unlike dealing with isolation and quarantine and outbreaks, we don't have expressed statutory or administrative code guidance as it relates to what can be done here. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the exercise of authority because the statute does deal with these general orders, but I'm talking about a specific mechanism that says, here's what can be ordered and here's how you enforce the order. And so it's difficult to try to figure out exactly what it is that a local health officer can order as it relates to applicability to the general public. And that difficulty is only exacerbated by the legislature v. Palm decision and what the Supreme Court interpreted as the extent of the DHS secretary's orders under 252.02 of the statutes, which not coincidentally is a statute right before the statute granting local health officers their authority. And so it's, it's difficult. So when we talk about these general orders, we have two different recognized powers, if you will, at the local level for local health officers as it relates to orders applicable to the general public. The first is statutory recognition that a local health officer has the authority to limit public gatherings. All right, so let's deal with that category first. When we're talking about public gatherings, that's a term that's utilized in the statute, but there is no statutory definition for the term public gatherings. So we had to define it in the way that as a lawyer, we go through the process of defining a term used in the statute that doesn't have a particular definition within the statute is we go through the analysis that courts have utilized over time to make that determination of what a term means. And so using those recognized canons of statutory construction, the term public gatherings includes all places and events that are open to the public at large. That means that the term public gathering isn't limited to just public spaces, but it's also open that term also applies to privately owned facilities that are open to the public at large. How do we get to that conclusion? Again, we go through statutory construction. I wanna make clear that the term public gathering as used in 252.03 has never been a topic of litigation. There is no court out there that has ever said this is how the term is defined for purposes of this statute. And so what we are doing is applying the rules of statutory construction that courts have recognized to the term public gathering. And so we go to the dictionary definition. We take a look at what the dictionary has said. We take a look at whether any other case in a different context has used the term public gathering. We take a look at similar statutes and the context of the use of the term public gathering within 252.03. And utilizing all of those various measures, we come out with uh, a definition of public gathering that found its way into this guidance. So we've got the public gathering definition. That's again, one category under broad orders of general applicability. That's one category under those orders. The other category is even less defined than the term public gathering. And that is that a local health officer has the ability to issue orders that are reasonable and necessary to prevent or suppress the spread of a communicable disease. So what's reasonable and necessary, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be founded upon the investigation and the reports that the local health officer has a duty to prepare. So that's gonna help define what's reasonable and necessary. And then the question becomes the imposition of restrictions on the public or the imposition of mandatory conduct on the part of the public. And so we've got the reasonable and necessary in relation to what the health officer believes and the health officer's discretion is going to be required for purposes of preventing the spread of a disease. And then we've got this legislature v. Palm decision that creeps its way back into the discussion. The reason it creeps its way back into the discussion is if you look at the legislature v. Palm decision, I'll start with this whole issue of it's not an easy read. There were so many different concurring and dissenting opinions. It's hard to figure out what the decision 
actually says and then apply what it says to the facts and circumstances surrounding our questions in 252.03. First point I want to make clear, legislature v. Palm had nothing to do with local health officers. The court had no opportunity to even take a look at 252.03. So then one might ask, well, then why are we concerned with it whatsoever? I mean, if it dealt with a different statute and a different set of defendants, why do we care at the local level what happened in legislature v. Palm? Well, the reason we care is that 252.02, which was an issue in Palm, is very similar to 252.03. And to the extent the court found issues with 252.03, that might give us some sort of insight as to how the court might look at an issue that arises under 252.03. And so again, when we talk about the concepts of legislature v. Palm and what this guidance in our ad hoc committee took a look at as it relates to issue spotting as a result of that decision, first, the court took a look at the legislative body, in that case, it was the Wisconsin legislature, their delegation of lawmaking authority to an unelected official. What the court was concerned with is that in 252.02, if you just take a look at the text of that statute, essentially the legislature by that statute said to Secretary Palm, you get to determine exactly what it is you can order on the general public. You get to determine how long that order is going to last. And by the way, you get to determine if criminal penalties are going to attach for violation of that order. In that circumstance, we as a Supreme Court have concerns with an unelected official being able to declare what the law is and attach penalties for noncompliance. And essentially, the court said, Secretary Palm, you don't get to be judge, jury, and executioner. There's no way that that combined rule works in our constitutional system. You can't delegate that type of legislative authority. So using the, what we learned in legislature v. Palm, do we have that concern at the local level? And the answer is perhaps. And so do we have a concern that a local health officer would have the ability to declare at the local level what the law is and attach a penalty for noncompliance, we absolutely have that concern. We'll talk more about that when we get to the enforcement part. But again, that's one of the concerns in Palm that the court highlighted that we took from that case and then applied in this guidance. And so the second issue that was apparent in Palm is this whole question of Chapter 227 rulemaking. In other words, the court said, Secretary Palm, when you have a rule of general application applicable to the public at large, there is a process under Wisconsin law where you go through rulemaking and have that rule codified in the administrative code, and there's legislative oversight in that process. So Secretary Palm, you should have gone through the, rule, the rulemaking process set forth in Chapter 227 of the statutes. We don't have a Chapter 227 requirement at the local level. So we are not as concerned about the court's statements regarding the rulemaking process in Chapter 227 as applied to a local health officer's authority but nonetheless, we talk to this because, again, the underpinnings, if you will, surrounding this whole concern that the court had with the rulemaking process is, again, the delegation of legislative authority. And the question is whether, as a legislative body at the local level, it has the authority to fully delegate its lawmaking role to an unelected official. So, again, it's issue spotting. As it relates to the Palm decision, we also had the Attorney General weighing in on what the Palm decision meant to local governments. Um, the Attorney General opinion was issued, I believe, three days after the Palm decision. It was issued in response to some specific questions that were provided to the Attorney General by a county. Um, the Attorney General, in his letter, admitted that this, this process is not the normal Attorney General opinion process. Typically, when a local government, a county, asks the Attorney General for an opinion. It is a months-long process that goes through various review procedures in the Attorney General's office before that opinion is issued. Obviously, this opinion did not go through that entire process. As well, there are several questions that I think that, in hindsight, I, I would have liked to ask the Attorney General um, that impact local health officer authority and enforcement mechanisms but weren't asked. And so I don't want anybody to read the guidance as somehow uh, criticizing what the Attorney General said, but I think the Attorney General was limited in that he was just answering the questions that were asked. And he was limited because he didn't have time to go through the customary process of vetting that opinion. And so the Attorney General um, couched his opinion uh, using words like may and, and You'll see in there the analysis may not apply to local powers. It doesn't come right out and say it will not apply to local powers. And I think that that's right. And the 
the brevity of the opinion and the, the desire to get information out to local units of government. So we have the Palm decision, we have the Attorney General opinion that attempts to, in certain circumstances, apply that Palm decision to the local level, but neither of those cases have clear, provide clarity as to how it is that a local health officer's powers and authorities are impacted, if at all, by the Palm decision, and frankly, the other cases that provided the precedent supporting the majority opinion in Palm. So we have those issues. When I talk about the other cases and other concepts that impact the analysis, there are constitutional limitations on these orders. When we're talking about the ability to curtail civil liberties, it's not a blank check that's giving, given to a health officer even in a time of a pandemic. There are certain civil liberties and constitutional guarantees that apply even in the time of a pandemic. So when we're talking about forbidding public gatherings, remember that we are potentially impacting an individual's First Amendment rights. We're impacting their ability to get together and talk on matters of public concern that would otherwise be protected under the First Amendment's free speech guarantee. So there are constitutional issues that we have to address and be mindful of as we're crafting these orders. In addition, we have the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause. Those clauses of the Constitution simply, in very simple terms, mean that we have to treat members of the public at large equally in terms of their various classes. If we are going to impact a suspect clause, for example, say that we're going to have a set of regulations that apply only to people who are over age 60, um, that's a suspect class, and so the Equal Protection Clause can take a hard look at that particular prohibition and say, you know, under the strict scrutiny test, the strict scrutiny standard, is that particular provision narrowly tailored only to further a legitimate governmental interest? By the same token, the Due Process Clause, we have to have due process of law. If we take away, as a government, somebody's life, liberty, or property, under the guise of a law that is so vague that it's hard for the general public to understand, we may have issues under the due process plan. So even though we have the Palm and the Attorney General analysis, there are several other legal issues that come into play here that we also have to consider as it relates to the, these orders of general application. So once we get over this hump of determining the scope of local health officer authority, then we have the question of enforcement and enforcement mechanisms. Again, when we're talking about isolation and quarantine orders and these outbreak orders, we have an enforcement mechanism. It's contained right within the administrative code. It's 145.06 of the administrative code. And in there, we have the various things that a court may order that an individual or a group of individuals may be ordered to do as a result of what the local, local health officer has found. Moreover, we have a procedure for getting into court. We know that the local health officer has to petition the court, has to give notice to the individual that is subject to the order, give them an opportunity to present their side of the case to the court. We have the burden, it falls on the local health officer to prove by clear and convincing evidence that what the local health officer is suggesting needs to happen is reasonable and necessary based upon the facts and circumstances presented to the court. And so in other words, if you take a look at the process that we have for enforcing isolation, quarantine, and outbreak orders, it's well-defined. It's well-defined by statute and administrative code, and it's a process and a system that has worked for years. It's worked primarily in the area of tuberculosis outbreaks. And so we've seen individuals, cases have gone all the way up to the Supreme Court dealing with this particular process in isolation, quarantine orders, uh, relative to a specific person for tuberculosis and other reasons. Where the rubber hits the road is when we get into this concept of enforcing orders of general applicability. Remember when I started talking about the Palm case and the Supreme Court's concerns with what Emergency Order 28 did vis-a-vis -vis allowing the delegate uh, legislative authority to Secretary Palm to declare the law and also declare the penalties and enforce the law, we, that's where this statute 252.25 comes into play. 252.25 is a statute that provides teeth to what it is that a health officer may order. 
The teeth says that any person who willfully violates or obstructs the execution of any state statute or rule, a county, city, or village ordinance, or a departmental order under this chapter is subject to penalty. This statute does not say that any person who violates or obstructs the execution of a local health order is subject to penalty. It says ordinance. So if we want to enforce a local health order, the enforcement mechanism is a local ordinance. So what is a local ordinance dealing with Chapter 252 communicable disease? What does that look like? How is it that we enforce a local health order as it relates to trying to craft an ordinance providing that enforcement mechanism? The guidance goes through some of the other cases around the country that have dealt with state and local orders and enforcement mechanisms. Again, those along with the Palm decision and the Attorney General's opinion help inform what it is that might be contained within the local ordinance. We've got a couple of examples in Wisconsin where we've had court cases filed. They've not made their way up to any sort of appellate review, but they've been filed and circuit courts and the uh, federal court in the Eastern District of Wisconsin have had the opportunity to weigh in, at least preliminarily, as it relates to this particular issue. And so those cases are discussed a bit in guidance. And so essentially you take all of that and you take a look at what are the considerations that a local government ought to weigh in determining what should be contained within its local ordinance. The guidance notes it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. There's no way we can come up with a model ordinance and say this is what you need to do at the local level because the considerations are varied. There are all sorts of legal considerations and policy considerations that go into building out that ordinance. And so when we speak to this whole concept of, again, putting on my lawyer hat and saying, how do we avoid risk? Do we want to have some sort of legislative body oversight on this? Maybe that might be a good idea. What does that look like at the local level? We have a variety of options here that we have as it relates to that legislative body oversight. And the guidance speaks to there might be an opportunity to have the legislative, legislative body in full just adopt the order. Remember when I talked about the cases that are existing currently in Wisconsin, you've got this Yandel case, which is the city of Racine case, where the Racine Common Council took the local health officer's order and in full codified that order as its ordinance. There you had a legislative body saying this order is going to be the law of the land. You had the Court of Appeals that took that case say there is a presumption of validity when it comes to local ordinances. And so when the legislative body speaks, we as a court are going to defer to the wisdom of the legislative body enacting that particular regulation. So one method of oversight might be to have the governing body adopted in total. The question that I'm going to get if I make a statement like that is how can we get the county board together on a day's notice to try to address what is truly an emergency situation. The county board is never going to be able to understand, deliberate, and adopt some sort of regulation on incredibly short notice. We're just not set up as a government to act in that fashion. And I don't disagree. I agree with that. So a concept that you may want to consider as a local government is placing durational limitations on what it is that a health officer can order and attach penalties to as it relates to violations of that order. And what I mean is it's almost like the concept, and it's actually very similar to the concept of giving emergency authority to a particular officer within county government. We're gonna give that officer emergency authority and we're gonna say for the next 48, 72 hours, one week, 10 days, whatever the case may be, we're going to say you get to order this and do this. It's going to give us time as a county in this circumstance to get the county board together and have a discussion about whether it is that we want to modify what the health officer has ordered, whether we want to weigh in on our own, or what we're going to declare the law of the county land to be. Okay, so again, durational limitations may play a role in this entire, entire legislative body oversight process. We know in the guidance this whole passive review process. There may be an element where a county in its ordinance wants to indicate that the health officer issues an order. The health officer is authorized to attach penalties to violation of that order. And then as a county, we reserve the right as a county board 
to engage in a passive review process whereby if we don't agree with that order and the penalties, we can convene as a body and overturn that order. That is another method of legis legislative oversight. And we have other examples in here as well. These examples are not a best worst. They're not better, worse. They're not ranked. It's up to the local body to determine what type of legislative body oversight is necessary, if any at all. I mean, I think that there's an argument there that if we say legislature v. Palm doesn't apply to local governments, we already have all we need in 252.03 for the local health officer to issue orders and make those orders enforceable and attach a penalty. Um, I'm not going to have an argument or disagree with that particular notion, but again, in terms of where we look at issue spotting with this guidance, I don't think we can ignore what happened in legislature v. Palm, nor do I think we can ignore what the Supreme Court might do if given the opportunity to review local, local health officer authority enforcement of orders of general applicability. The thing that I want to also stress here is that on these orders of general applicability, I can't think of any circumstance in my lifetime where local health officers have ever issued an order of general applicability. This is rare. This is a unique set of circumstances. We are dealing with a very small subset of a subset of a subset of what local health officers do on a daily basis. And so I don't want people to get too hung up on this whole concept of legislative body oversight as it relates to everything a health officer does. The only thing we're talking about here on legislative body oversight is establishing the law of the land and attaching a penalty to a violation of that law. That's all we're talking about here. And so again, we wanted to make that clear in the guidance. So before I move on to the conclusions here within the guidance, why don't I turn it back to Eric to see if he has any comments on the enforcement section. Yep, thanks Andy. Um, you know, I uh, would just briefly share, um, going back to some earlier comments about risk management, I just uh, you know, want to make sure um, to have a chance to emphasize the public health component of the work as it relates to both risk management and um, lead into the enforcement issues. Uh, the guidance initially or intentionally starts with a description of what the public health work is that's required to manage communicable disease. Um, and you know, certainly that work ranges in scale from what that might be. But public health is responsible in essence for the risk management of a community's morbidity and mortality from COVID, but also other diseases. And so while that's not inherently mutually exclusive to the concept of legal risk management, I think at times it does create us, you know, cause a situation where we look at things from, you know, the same policy issues from a different perspective. And again, that, that was the work of the work group. Um, what is understood in the guidance, and I think throughout the conversations that we had and can't be emphasized enough, is that public health's work starts with a very thorough science-based investigation to assess both what the current exposure is, as well as the potential risk to the individuals and the communities. And that investigation really drives what the work is, whether it's simply an order related to an outbreak, the isolation and quarantine management and enforcement, or if we get to, in, in what Andy just said, are a rare circumstances, a necessity for a general order or an activity of general application, you know, that, that groundwork has been established in that, um, in that investigation and that reporting. There's also continual reporting to administrative officials and, and elected officials throughout the public health response. And so that form of oversight, you know, has, has been in place for, um, you know, for as long as the statute um, was written. Um, a successful response then is really dependent from a public health standpoint on a couple of key factors. The ability to cooperate and partner with, with others, uh, whether it's community leaders, elected officials, other county administration, but that, that partnership is really key, that coalition building and certainly the education and awareness building to, to gain compliance. But at times, you know, all of that activity, all the education in the world maybe doesn't lead to the compliance that we need in order to successfully address an outbreak. And that's where we get to where we're at right now, which is how do we, um, how do we enforce um, those orders of general application? Um, I, I think the, the guidance provides, is, pr provides a nice range for everyone to consider in local discussions. City of Racine is specifically mentioned as one community. 
But there are other examples throughout the state that have, uh, as I said earlier, some communities have start and stop, some have moved forward. And so there are other examples out there that I think exemplify the other options and the guidance. Um, the factors though range considerably um, based on what makes the most sense for your given community. The, the current spread, the risk of that, that disease, resources and, and available capacity and previous experience you had. Um, you know, what other emergency situations have you worked together on which might also influence what um, kind of enforcement mechanism you proceed with. Um, so in conclusion, uh, and, and I wanna make sure I get to Andy and any questions that people have, what, what is common across everyone's situation is the importance and really the urgency to meet, to review this guidance, to have these discussions so that we're prepared for tomorrow, we're prepared for the next couple of months, we're prepared for again, what is expected to be you know, more months of pandemic and other future emerging unanticipated public health emergencies. Good points, Eric, thank you. Um, continuing on with the guidance, because I know we wanna leave a bit of time for questions. I wanna clarify and, and make certain that everybody understands that this isn't cut and paste with this ordinance. We broke this out into various sections that we think might be a good idea to include within your local ordinance. We provided some considerations as it relates to building out those sections of the ordinance, but what's contained in the ordinance is really up to each particular county or local government. We round out the guidance with some other issues that the committee discussed that really didn't fit in the context of talking about local health officer authority and enforcement of those orders. And then we have appendices and the appendices provide forms that can be utilized as it relates to that process under chapter DHS 14506 of the administrative code in enforcing isolation, quarantine, and those quote unquote outbreak orders. So with that, that rounds out our review of the guidance and Sarah, I'll perhaps turn it back to you and see, it doesn't look like we have any questions uh, that are currently pending. So if maybe you wanna remind folks how they might ask questions, that might be a good idea because we have a few minutes here before our hour is up. Sure, thank you very much, Andy and Eric. Again, if you do have a question, we ask that you type it into the Q&A function in Zoom, which is located on the bottom uh, center right of your screen. In addition, if you join via phone and you have a question, please hit star nine and we will recognize and unmute you. So we will give this just a, a, a few moments to see if anybody is typing in any questions right now. Um, and Anne-Marie will let us know if anybody has a question on the phone. Uh, just so folks are aware, you will be able to find copies of this guidance as well as uh, recordings of this webinar as well as Monday's webinar on our website. So they will be available for you to share with others who may have been unable to join us either Monday morning or this morning. Questions. I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A. Anne-Marie, I assume you're not seeing anything either? That's correct. I have no raised hands. Okay. Well, at this point, um, I think we'll wrap up the webinar then. If folks do have questions as they do continue to uh, review the guidance, you can certainly give the Wisconsin Counties Association a call and we would be more than happy to assist in answering that question for you. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining uh, this morning and uh, we look forward to continued discussions with you as, as we continue through this, this public health crisis. Thank you.